All right. Well, welcome. Uh, welcome to this presentation on the Columbus Day Storm of 1962 with Ted Beener. Uh, my name is Jennifer Kearns. I'm a librarian at Mill Creek Library. Uh, before we begin, I'm just going to give you some housekeeping notes. Um, your mics are muted. Um, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. We are monitoring chat. Um, we can answer any questions you have about the library, um, and we will save questions and give them to our presenter at the end of his program. So uh, if questions uh, come to you as he is giving his remarks, uh, feel free to put those in the chat. We will save them till the end. Um, this event is being recorded. Um, it will be available with captions on the Snow Isle Library's YouTube page probably in a week or so. Um, Closed captions are available um, from Zoom. Uh, if you look on the bottom of your screen, uh, look for the little CC button if you would like to turn on those captions. Um, and I think that's basically it. Um, as always, Snow Isle Libraries is not responsible for the behavior of people in the chat. I'm supposed to tell you that. I think you know. Um, and we will remove anyone who is being disruptive or rude in the chat. We have never had to do that, but just so you know, we can. Um, now, let me introduce our presenter. Um, Ted Beener was a meteorologist with the National Weather Service for 40 years. Currently, he is an instructor for the National Disaster Preparedness Training Center, chair of the Washington State Emergency Communications Committee, and a board member for Emergency Management Group Washington. Um, if you've ever gotten a weather warning on your smartphone, you can thank Ted for that. Um, and if you're in the habit of listening to local radio for weather and traffic updates, you are already familiar with his voice. Uh, today, he is here to talk to us about the Columbus Day storm, which socked the Pacific Northwest in 1962. What happened? How did it happen? Can it happen again? Welcome, Ted. All right. Thank you very much, Jennifer. And hello, everybody. Good evening, or perhaps good day, if you're from other parts of the world at this point. Again, a reminder, if you have any questions that come up in your mind during the course of this presentation, uh, please put them in the chat box. We're going to have time at the end to address many of the questions that will be submitted in the chat box. Really encourage you to do that. So tonight, we're going to talk about the Columbus Day Storm. I'm going to tell it kind of like a story, more like a book. So we're going to talk about the story of this historic uh, windstorm. And I'm curious, but you may recognize that I'm also an amateur radio operator. That is my call sign there at the bottom, W6 Tango Oscar Romeo. So what we're going to talk about over the next oh, 30, 35 minutes or so, so we leave time for questions, kind of a big overview of the storm itself, and then what happened and why did it happen? And we'll look at the history of windstorms for the Pacific Northwest, at least on a broad perspective, and then address the question, could it happen again? And then I will wrap up with a personal story about the Columbus Day storm. <clears throat> First of all, what was the storm itself? This was on October 12th, 1962. And I put the bullet here, most are not aware of it because this was practically 60 years ago now. Most people that live here today were not born yet or they have moved into the area uh, since that time uh, frame. So this is really kind of an awareness of the, not only this storm, but storms like it that can produce substantial uh, winds and damage associated with them. Now, the Columbus Day storm was the strongest non-tropical windstorm ever to hit the lower 48 in American history. It is the granddaddy of all windstorms. All other windstorms are compared to the Columbus Day storm. And why is that the case? Well, I've got a chart here from the 50th anniversary of the Columbus Day storm uh, back in uh, 10 years ago. And so that would make this year the 60th year since that storm. 
And this is from a Washington State Emergency Management brochure that we put together. And it kind of shows some of the wind speeds that occurred from Northern California all the way into Southern British Columbia and a general outline of the path of the storm. Along the Oregon and Washington coast, winds hit 150 miles per hour. And that is a category four hurricane wind force. That's just really substantial. In the interior Western uh, valleys from Eugene all the way up to Vancouver, BC, there were a number of places that had winds in excess of 100 miles per hour. More on the storm, this is another chart from a researcher, uh, I know him quite well, uh, Wolf Reed, showing kind of an outline of the wind speeds that were associated with this storm. There were 46 fatalities directly as a result of this windstorm. Hundreds of people were injured. It destroyed thousands of buildings. I'm going to show you some of the pictures from this particular event. And here's an interesting uh, statistic. It blew down 15 billion board feet of timber. Yeah, 15 billion from the coast all the way to western Montana. And I put the bullet there. It created a new industry. With all the trees that were down, it just flooded the market for uh, timber and timber prices just plummeted. But at the same time, you might recall in your history that in Japan, they were really having a robust economy, making the recovery from World War II. They were building like crazy over there and using a lot of timber products from our region here. So they just couldn't make the, the timber fast enough here, especially when the prices were so low. They were selling it for you know, pennies practically. So it created a new industry and that is shipping the entire log. So they were harvesting the down timber as logs, putting them on ships and sending them across the Pacific to Japan where they could mill the, the, the lumber on site there. And that industry is still in place today, uh, shipping logs overseas. More on the storm itself, millions of people were without power from the San Francisco Bay Area all the way into southern British Columbia. And because of the devastation associated with it, with all the down lines and just the entire power infrastructure was really taken out. It took several months to totally restore power throughout the region. Now, in 1962, that amounted to about $250 million in damage to the power structures, to pipelines, to buildings, etc. If you translate that to today's dollars, that would be $2.2 billion worth of damage. And many describe this storm as comparable to a land uh, falling hurricane. A little bit on the why. Some people call this a typhoon because it had hurricane force type winds. And it was born in a way as Typhoon Frida. You see it in the lower left-hand side there uh, starting on October 5th. That's when it became strong enough to be a typhoon, which is the equivalent of a hurricane uh, in the Western Pacific. Now, each of the little dots you see there are where the center of the storm was every 12 hours. Now. Typhoons slash hurricanes are very slow movers, and that's why you see all those dots are really, really close together there on the left side of your screen. But as the storm moved northward, it moved out over cooler waters, it started to die out. By the time it got up close to the uh, just south of the Aleutian Islands, it became extra tropical. In other words, it was no longer a typhoon or hurricane or a warm core storm. It had become now a cold core storm. Uh, in that region. But then you notice <clears throat> those dots get really separated apart. That system got caught in a very strong jet stream, about 200 knots. And the jet stream, for those who are not familiar, is the storm track. It's that ribbon of really strong winds up where about where the jets fly, okay, 30, 35,000 feet uh, up into the atmosphere. As a result, that storm really moved to the uh, southeast and just off the California coast, got it caught into a what's called an upper level trough, a really sharp turn. It's like making that sharp turn on the highway. And when it did that, it intensified dramatically. Uh, it's I'll show you here in just a moment. It's called a meteorological bomb. We'll talk about that term here in just a bit. 
And you can see on October 12th itself, it moved rapidly up the Pacific Northwest coast from off of California into Southern British Columbia. So I mentioned uh, meteorological bombs. This is one of the slides I have from another presentation called Significant Weather Events That Impact the Pacific Northwest. This one's focusing on our windstorms. I mentioned the term meteorological bombs. The new term, which you probably heard this past fall, is bomb cyclone. It's the same thing. And what that means is a drop of 24 millibars of atmospheric pressure or more in 24 hours. And when it makes that sharp left turn, like you see in this hand-drawn diagram that the Weather Bureau, this is before the National Weather Service, they used any time they had a system that had this path, they knew they were gonna get hit by a very strong windstorm. So that's the kind of pattern that's involved with this. Now out at sea, boy, these, these cyclone bombs can produce really significant seas. Look at this ocean liner uh, this cruise ship that's just being bounced around in the uh, in the heavy seas. The image on the right here is a Coast Guard vessel going across the Columbia River bar. Um, I joke sometimes that surfs up, grab your boards, except that's just way too dangerous for that situation. But the point here is that these storms can produce significant uh, swell trains and heavy heavy seas and heavy surf in our region. Another look at the Columbus Day storm in comparison to a few others that we may be familiar with. Um, the Columbus Day storm here is tracked in the orange that you see, and you can see how close it got to the uh, Oregon and Washington coast as it moved northward. Another comparable one in the blue is the pair of windstorms that occurred in mid-November of 1981. Again, a similar path, but a little bit further offshore. And another one was in uh, December 12, 1995. Again, a very rather uh, similar type of weather pattern. Another study, another plot of these kinds of storms going back even further in time. Again, you see kind of the same pattern of storms turning left and coming up the Pacific Northwest coast. We had an unusual exception though. You see one in December of 1977, it was practically a straight line. So was the Hanukkah Eve windstorm, December 06. It basically followed that line uh, right into Southern British Columbia. I think many of us were around for that particular storm here, uh, what now, 15 years ago at this point. One of the key points with the Hanukkah Eve windstorm or any windstorm for that matter, the direct impacts are down trees and power outages. But let's talk a, a little bit about secondary impacts. For the Hanukkah Eve windstorm, there were 15 fatalities here in Western Washington. Only four of them were direct impacts, people hit by fallen trees or maybe a power line. The other from the secondary impacts is a result of all the power outages. A lot of people didn't have any heat. And with so many new people in this area not knowing what happens when you bring a barbecue or other heating source inside the house to keep things warm and maybe cook food is carbon monoxide poisoning. 11 people died from carbon monoxide poisoning and hundreds others were poisoned and in the hospital as a result of that. So that was one of our key lessons, particularly those that are not English speaking uh, people. Now this satellite loop is from a very similar kind of storm back in early March, just 10 years ago. And this is about a 19 or 20 hour uh, satellite loop. If you look closely, above the word March, you'll see that the time clock that's ticking there as this thing's going by. The point I wanna show here, again, this is a storm that moved basically right up 130 degrees west or about 250 miles off the coast. But you can see how fast it moves. It's not a hurricane. This is a cold core uh, North Pacific cyclone moving very rapidly at this point. This particular storm had strong enough winds in the Puget Sound area to knock down trees, and I think winds peaked somewhere around 70 miles per hour or so, even though the center of the storm was well to the west. And we had one tree that came down in Seward Park in Seattle, landed on a pickup truck, and unfortunately killed the driver. So <clears throat> a little bit more on the why. Back in 1962, with regards to weather observations, we didn't have weather satellites like you just saw. There was, there, there was no Doppler weather radar, it didn't exist at this point. 
there were no ocean weather buoys. We did have ship reports, but if you get close to a big storm like that, that's eh, not the place where you want to be. They, t they tend to steer away from it as quickly as they can uh, to stay out of harm's way and not become a victim. So back then, uh, you had a lot of land station reports, but realistically, your observations were pretty limited. You had weather balloons, but that's not out over the ocean. You get the idea. Now, what's interesting about this, because I'll go into the Weather Bureau forecast here in just a moment. In talking with some of the Weather Bureau forecasters in Portland, Oregon, that addressed this particular storm, one thing that was kind of a uh-oh moment was as that storm was tracking north from Northern California onto the Oregon coast, the weather stations that normally report disappeared. They either lost power or their weather instrumentation was destroyed by the strong winds. So in real out, uh, reality, we really don't know how strong the winds were with this particular storm. The ones we can report are the ones I showed you earlier, but we don't know exactly how strong the peak of the winds were, really were. Now, weather modeling, eh, think about where computers were in 1962. Uh, you know, you didn't have a handheld device, there were no PCs, none of these kinds of things. Basically, it was really in its infancy at this point. So the Weather Bureau forecast for this storm, uh, originally it was 40 gusts 70, and they, they bumped it up as the day wore on when they had that uh-oh moment that was occurring at that particular point. And on the right here is a air pressure barograph from Salem, Oregon. And the point I want to show here, you'll see two what I call check marks or V's that, that are in here. The first one was a storm that had a similar path, was further offshore, not nearly as, as strong winds and impactful. But the Columbus Day storm is the one on the right hand side for that V. Look how sharply the barometer fell and then sharply rose. <clears throat> and when the pressures rose dramatically like that, that is when those strong winds occurred. And it was only for about two or three or four hours, depending on the location, where those strong winds occurred. But so much damage occurred during that particular time period. Now, we were talking about bomb cyclones earlier. This particular infrared satellite image is from October 24th, just a few months ago. And I happened to save it. Uh, I was using it for a means of social media. And you can see the center of this low pressure here was at 948 millibars, but it was roughly 300 nautical miles off the coast. So not too much in the way of strong winds here. It was blustery out on the coast, but it was still far enough offshore not to be a significant event for us. Remember, there were two of these, but they basically had the same path. The center pressure for the Columbus Day storm, which was a lot closer, was measured at Astoria, Oregon at 960 millibars. So my point here is that we get a lot of these meteorological bombs or bomb cyclones a number of times uh, across the North Pacific. In fact, there's one heading for the Aleutian Islands as we speak right now. The center pressure is about 950 millibars. So they're very, yeah, very intense storms. Um, but because they're so far offshore, we really don't notice them unless you're out on the coast and <clears throat> you've got a, a surfboard and you want to surf some of these 20 and 30 footers that are crashing onto the coastline. <clears throat> but the ones we really want to take notice of are the ones that start to hug the coastline like you saw in some of those storm tracks we had earlier. So let's take a look at some pictures of what happened. I mentioned all the timber that was blown down and here is just some of the images and there's so many others. I mean, look at the size of that tree that came down that was about a thousand years old. And look at the blowdowns up in the mountains, just dramatic, just entire swaths of trees that were knocked over as a result of this particular storm. I talked about how many buildings were uh, destroyed or damaged. Here's a, a, a barn in this case. Here's a building inside of, I think this was in Tacoma, for instance. Uh, you know, a lot of other structures. In fact, in the case of airplanes and airplane hangars, they were just torn apart and tossed around like tinker toys. 
I mentioned the power uh, infrastructure. This is an interesting contrasting picture. This is from the Bonneville Power Administration uh, down in Vancouver, Washington. You can see this transmission tower, fully erect, a hundred, couple hundred feet tall, et cetera. But after the windstorm, just totally flattened out of the way. Here's another one that was near Longview, Washington, again, belonging to the Bonneville Power Administration. And it was built to withstand up to 100 mile per hour winds. I would say the winds were a little stronger than that. Um, and again, just the infrastructure for the, the power industry as a whole. I mean, power poles, lines, all the major transmission towers, et cetera, were just ripped apart. And as a result, boy, it's, it, this happens across the country all the time, but all kinds of resources come in from other parts of the country to help rebuild the power uh, infrastructure whether it's a hurricane or in this case, the Columbus Day storm. They also brought in a lot of telephone uh, uh, industry folks to come and rebuild the telephone lines that back then as well. Some more images from here, you can see a, a school gymnasium roof is gone. And when you uproot trees, well, they, sometimes they take the pipelines that are involved there. Here, we're looking at water, but it could be a gas line, you know, any of those kinds of things. So keep in mind during a windstorm, if any of those kinds of pipelines get you know, uprooted, uh, you could have breaks in them as well. The Columbus Day storm here in Wa Western Washington came during Friday night football. There were some high school games that actually went ahead and played in those strong winds. I can't imagine they didn't have much of a passing game. It was probably all on the ground. But many others said, you know, this is too much. We're losing power, everything. They just shut it all down and, and sent people home. And here's another image where one tree took out not only a pickup truck, but landed on a home as well. And I can remember when this happened myself, playing amongst the, the new toys in the yard. Here you have a down tree and all the kids are playing in amongst it there. And this, I think that was on uh, Whidbey Island at, at Oak Harbor. So let's take a look at our history of these strong, impactful windstorms that have struck our region. And this is just a fraction of the list, and I'm listing just some of the, the biggest storms that we've had. Now, the one that was probably closest to the Columbus Day storm of 1962 was nicknamed the Storm King back in early January of 1880. We don't have any significant reports and anything. I mean, this is you know in the latter part of the 19th century. However, according to literature and historians, this particular storm uh, again, was highly impactful from Northern California into Southern British Columbia. It produced heavy rains and floods in California and Southern Oregon, strong damaging winds through the central part of the region and further north, and that includes the Puget Sound area. Uh, it resulted in a lot of heavy, wet snow in this particular case. So it was a rather unique storm in that regard. Here's another one called the Great Olympic Blowdown, uh, late January of 1921. If you ever visit the Lake Quinault Lodge, um, and there's trails across the street there that you can walk, in amongst those trails, you will find some of these huge trees that were blown down in this particular windstorm. It's fascinating to see them even 100 years later. Another one was the what's called the classic windstorm in uh, on winter solstice of 1940 and this what was unique about this particular one is that galloping Gertie had just come down a couple of months earlier and it brought down more of the bridge this during this particular wind event. Now on that bear graph I showed you from Salem Oregon you saw a pair of, of V's or check marks there. Sometimes these come in as double windstorms, and that's what occurred in late October of 1950. You might remember the Kitsap blowdown if you've been here going back to uh, mid-February of 1979. Another name for this windstorm was the Hood Canal Bridge windstorm. I'll show you a picture of what happened with that here in just a bit. I mentioned double windstorms. I personally worked this particular storm with the National Weather Service here in Seattle in mid-November of 1981. Again, one storm, the winds let up, and here came a second one. 
So if anything got weakened the first round, uh, here comes some more punches from uh, the heavyweight to knock down more trees and create more power outages. Oh, the Thanksgiving Day windstorm, 1983. This particular one hit right around midday, moving from south to north through the Puget Sound area. A lot of folks were cooking their uh, Thanksgiving turkeys, and then the power went out, and they couldn't cook them anymore. So it created a new phenomenon. A lot of people said, well, now what am I going to do? Hey, why don't we put the turkey on the barbecue outside? And that's how a lot of people finish their, their uh, uh, cooking their turkeys. And that phenomenon has continued to this day. The Inauguration Day windstorm of 1993. Uh, I would say if the Columbus Day storm on a scale of 0 to 10 was a 10, the Inauguration Day windstorm was a 6. A very impactful windstorm. It hit during the morning commute. It was actually well forecast the night before because I know the forecaster who put out the high wind warning at about nine o'clock the night before, but it didn't get well disseminated, didn't get spread out by the media, et cetera, very well at all. And as a result, it caught a lot of people by surprise the following morning, including school buses taking kids to school and commuters going to work and trees coming down and, and traffic signal uh, going out with the lack of power, et cetera. The next one, we saw the storm track on this earlier, was the uh, uh, mid-December windstorm of 1995. Again, a very strong storm. It was probably about a five on that scale of zero to 10, but a lot of people didn't get their power back until Christmas Day in that particular event. And then I mentioned the Hanukkah Eve windstorm of mid-December of 06. Um, in that particular one, we had about 1.5 million people without power in Western Washington. And there were some people that didn't get their power back until a little after Christmas for that particular storm. Now the question, could it happen again? The upper left-hand image, by the way, is what was left of the Hood Canal Bridge a, a day or two afterwards. And then you see Gallup and Gertie down there at the Tacoma Narrows Bridge uh, in Tacoma. So to answer this question, the short answer is yes, it could happen again. Some interesting statistics that I would like you to take with you uh, here tonight. In 1962, the population of Western Washington was about 1.25 million people. Today, it's about six and a half million people. And if you think about all the infrastructure that supports today's population, anything from utilities to highways, bridges, anything along those lines, as well as all the buildings and homes, particularly that have spread out, maybe out into the Kitsap Peninsula or up towards the Cascade foothills, etc. We put a lot more infrastructure closer to harm's way in case we have a big windstorm like this. And then I have a, a fun little story here about our floating bridges. Of course, the Hood Canal Bridge and the Mercer Island Bridge were in place in 1962. One that was almost done, but not in operation yet, was the Evergreen Point Floating Bridge. Now, it had the structure all the way across the lake at that point, but they hadn't finished it. It was due to open in the spring of 1963. But if you remember, that floating bridge and many of our others are sitting on concrete pontoons. They're full of air. Yes, concrete does float. <laughs> it's like a bubble uh, with, the, with the structure on top of those pontoons. Well, in the Columbus Day storm, that thing got thrashed around quite a bit in uh, on Lake Washington from all the, the uh, surf action. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I talked to uh, a Washington State Department of Transportation bridge superintendent. His first name was Archie. He's retired a number of years ago, but I talked to him as he got close to retirement. And that individual, why? he could tell what was going on with the bridge with regards to the creaking and the croning and anything. Uh, he would be in that little tower that was right in the middle of the structure. Well, he told me, you might remember that twice a year, uh, the DOT would shut down the Evergreen Floating Bridge for maintenance, okay? Well, you know what they were doing primarily? They were going into those concrete pontoons pumping the water out and recocking the cracks. So the Columbus Day storm cracked some of those pontoons and uh, they were constantly 
uh, repairing those cracks until the day we have the new Evergreen Point floating bridge like we do today. So I want to ask this question to you. What would our world look like if we had another Columbus Day storm like wind event? Winds of 100 miles per hour or so here in the Puget Sound area. What would be those impacts? Consider the idea of what that could be. Now, I'm going to finish up here with a personal story. I myself grew up in the Portland, Oregon area. Uh, our home was uh, in the West Hills, a little bit north of Canyon Road near the Sylvan uh, uh, area near the summit there west of downtown Portland. Uh, I was six years of age at that point, so I've given away my age here. Yes, I know what Medicare is. Um, and my mother uh, picked us, the kids, there were three of us, from school. Uh, she drove downtown to the Safeway store at 12th and Jefferson and picked up a lot of provisions. And I can remember standing in the parking lot while the uh, bag boy, yes, we had bag boys back then, was putting the groceries into the station wagon. And my mom pointed out how fast the clouds to our west were flying by. Now, knowing my knowledge today, they were probably in the 10 to 15,000 foot uh, level at that point, uh, but they were just going really fast, going from uh, south to north from my perspective. Uh, and kind, kind of a funny color to them, a yellowish greenish looking color. So we drove home. Again, we're near, near Sylvan, a lot of trees in that area. And uh, it wasn't long after that that the windstorm hit. Uh, the bridge on the Morrison Street Bridge had a peak wind of 112 miles per hour within 10 minutes of the start of the windstorm and then the lost power. So we again, don't know what the max uh, wind speed was. But as a result of uh, losing our power, well, we had half-baked potatoes for dinner that night. We were around the kitchen table using the flashlights, the candles, the hurricane lantern. Uh, the kids are all trying to play bingo. And I just remember all the thumps of the trees falling in the yard outside and tree limbs landing on the roof. And it was pretty frightening for a little six-year-old. Well, the storm only lasted a few hours. It was pretty much done by eight o'clock. Um, and it was time to go to bed. So I went up to my bedroom and from my window, I could see to the uh, transmitter towers up in the West Hills there, all those blinking red lights that were up there. Well, that night there were no red blinking lights. In fact, looking at it a little later, all those TV and radio towers have been blown down. Looking uh, next day and beyond, I had 160 trees down on my street alone, no power for 10 days, no school. By the time we got back into school, the, the Cuban Missile Crisis was underway because I can remember as a first grader going up against the um, brick wall and trying to protect ourselves in case something happened in Portland. Uh, but this particular windstorm sparked my interest in weather. I asked my mom, why did this happen? And so she got me some books. Uh, the bottom line here, cutting this a little short, is by the time I was age 10, I was providing forecasts for my classmates in school. Uh, by the time I got to high school and my senior year, uh, I can remember the earth sciences teacher asked if I wanted to teach the weather segment to the sophomores in, again, earth science. And I did. I just remember Mr. Goodrich sitting at his desk with his feet up and he had a Cheshire cat smile on his face while I was going through all that material for him. Uh, he was enjoying it quite a bit and I got I got credit for it as well. Um, I knew where I was going. Uh, I went to school at Oregon State University and uh, got into the National Weather Service in 1977 and retired uh, early in 2018. So um, just a strong, passionate interest in this field. Now, I would be remiss if we didn't talk about anything that we can do to get ready for the next storm. So with regards to windstorms, uh, they typically blow down trees and limbs. I'm probably singing to the choir, you know that, and results in power outages. But here's something you gotta need to think about. Can you uh, go without power and transportation for an extended period of time? Psychologically, if people don't have their power back within 72 hours, they start to get pretty irritable. 
Okay, I think we've experienced that to some degree. So before the storm, ask yourself, what, what do I need if I'm going to be stuck at home for days without power? What am I going to need? Gas in the car, medicines, uh, food, water, blankets, anything to keep me warm, any of those kinds of things. Think about what you personally may need for that. Now, during the storm, those indirect fatalities, just don't go outside. There's been too many cases where people are hit by falling limbs or trees or stepping on power lines that they couldn't see because it was dark or is covered underneath the branches, whatever the case may be. Another tip, and there's lots of them. I'll give you a resource for that in just a moment. Uh, but any electronics that could be harmed, in other words, by a power surge, so if you've got some expensive electronics, maybe it's that computer system or that sound system or that big uh, large screen television, any of those kinds of things uh, that could be harmed by a power surge, consider unplugging them and just uh, hang in there during the particular windstorm. And another one is if you're going to potentially lose power and you have electric heat or you have something that involves electricity to turn on your furnace, maybe start your fireplace up so that it is already operating uh, uh, while the storm is going on and before the power goes out. And then you, it will be, you really would like to have that heat, really helpful. And then after the storm, of course, report any power outages. That's how power utilities really get a good fine feel, uh, fine tuned feel for what's going on in their area responsibility. Uh, if you're outside, really try to avoid any down power lines at least 30 feet away, at least 30 feet away from any down power lines, and of course, report those as well. And if you have a backup power generator or a heat source, anything like that, propane, whatever, make sure you keep that outdoors, or in the case of generators, make sure it's well ventilated outdoors, not in the garage, but outdoors to avoid the carbon monoxide poison issues. A little bit more on readiness. You know, I, we've been talking about windstorms, but it can apply to any of these hazards and many more. The bottom line is being able to be ready in case something happens, whether you're at home or on the road, whatever the case may be. So that means having those kits at home, the food, the water, the blankets, the medicines, whatever the case may be. And don't forget your pets um, and your to-go kits. Uh, we saw some good examples of that with the recent Boulder County, Colorado uh, wildfire that swept through that region. People literally had to grab what they had and ran. Uh, and then kits in the cars. A really good example of that was the recent uh, heavy snow event in the mid-Atlantic states just a few weeks ago where people were stuck on Interstate 95 for over 24 hours and they weren't prepared in many cases. So again, having those emergency kits in your car is also important. Food, water, blankets, uh, things along those lines. I mentioned a resource. Here it is, takewinterbystorm.org. It has plenty of checklists uh, for your home, for your car, for your pets, etc., and is in multiple languages. One of those lessons we learned from the Hanukkah Eve windstorm of December 2006. And then communications. Um, consider what you would do if you had no power and no phones. Keep in mind that your cell phones, most of the towers do not have backup generators. They will have batteries, might last 45 or 60 minutes. After that, you got no cell service. Um, so keep that in mind. I mentioned I'm an amateur radio operator. That might be something you might want to consider for your yourself, your neighborhood, uh, so, so you can be able to communicate with other organizations such as Snohomish County Emergency Management or Skagit County Emergency Management, Island County Emergency Management, et cetera. Um, a really good source for information after the storm and what's going on and who's doing what is radio. And keep in mind that that radio in your car will work for you. Or if you have a radio in the home with extra batteries, again, uh, that's something else that you can use as a resource to stay informed on what's going on. I can tell you after the Hanukkah Eve windstorm in December 06, there were a lot of rumors going around. And there were times when I had to pick up the phone and call one of the radio stations and say, and as soon as I called in and said, we've got you on air in three seconds, you know. Uh, but we, we talked about reality. There were a lot of rumors about the next storm to strike and things like that. 
Um, I mentioned NOAA Weather Radio. It's an all hazard system. It behaves like a smoke detector, but for all hazards, and it can provide you with the latest weather information from the National Weather Service 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And finally, with regards to outer region contacts, again, this is somebody you can contact in the case of like a big earthquake, and you won't be able to call locally, but you may be able to reach somebody uh, like a relative in uh, Chicago or in Dallas or in California, whatever the case may be, and be able to say, we're okay, uh, you know, people are home from, from school or work or whatever the case may be. You can provide that additional information there. And that is the story of the Columbus Day storm. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, you see my Twitter handle there. And I also have a uh, North Sound Weather Minute podcast on everettpost.com. And I produce some stories there as well, on top of doing traffic and weather together for either the morning or afternoon commutes on the two Snohomish County radio stations. Thank you. Ted, thank you very much. That was really interesting. Um, let's get to some of the comments and questions that we've had. Um, I want you to know that throughout your presentation, people have been sharing their memories and stories of the storm. I don't have time, I don't think, to read them all to you, but they're really interesting and we will send them to you. I think you'll enjoy them. Oh, um, I've had, uh, even getting ready for this tonight, I had a lot of people, I remember when <laughs> I was five years old or I was eight years old and this is what happened. I've had a lot of that over the years, yes. Yeah, it, it's really, it's really, it, it lends a whole nother, um, it, it, it lends a whole nother uh, element to it if you hear some of these stories. Um, my favorite here is from Judy who says her fourth grade teacher that morning forecast a big storm coming because the hamsters in the classroom were acting strangely. <laughs> so there you go. Thank you, Judy. See, they were responding to the rapidly falling atmospheric pressure. That's what was going on. The, it was the pressure they could tell. Uh -huh. Okay. So here are some questions for you um, from Bruce, just some clarification. Can you explain to us the difference between typhoon, hurricane, extra tropical storm what what are the definitions of these things what are the differences okay with regards to a hurricane or a typhoon they are warm core storms they need a minimum of 80 degree sea surface temperatures that is where that's the fuel for the fire so if you think about the very active atlantic hurricane seasons we've had the last couple of years remember uh, not 2021, but 2020, we had 30 named storms. To give you a feel for how warm the water has been uh, of late, in the Gulf of Mexico, the sea surface temperatures have been in the mid and upper 80s. I mean, like bath water. And for these uh, tropical cyclones, they are that's just fuel for the fire. That's just throwing gasoline into them. Now, with regards to extra tropical cyclones, the ones that are cold core. I mentioned uh, when uh, Frida was drifting north, it was moving away from the warm water, which is feeding the storm and moving into colder waters, and then it weakened. And we even see that with uh, hurricanes in the Atlantic or even the Eastern Pacific, uh, where they move further north into the Atlantic, reach those colder waters, and then tend to dissipate. And that's what happened with, uh, with Frida in this particular case as well. So if I could show you a satellite loop at the moment, but you would see all these cold core systems that are moving across the North Pacific right now. As I mentioned, one of them is literally a cyclone bomb that's just south of the Aleutian Islands, and it's just in the process of starting to die out now. I hope that answers your question, Bruce. Okay, and thank you. Um, someone else, I think it was, a couple of different people have asked about millibars. Um, and the relationship between millibars and wind speed. Can you clarify that? Yeah, to some degree. Um, millibars is a form of uh, measuring atmospheric pressure, and that's a worldwide um, measurement uh, tool, if you wish. 
I know we have barometers that measure it in inches. That's the old English system. Um, but simply put, the lower the atmospheric pressure, uh, I want you to think of it three dimensionally, where you're starting to get down towards the bottom. And if you had water spinning around, it's getting faster and faster and faster, much like a um, ice skater. When they bring their arms in to, to spin, that's when they get faster. That's what happens with your uh, really more intense uh, low pressure systems, such as your bomb cyclones or the Columbus Day storm. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Um, why do you think we don't have more underground power rather than having them out on these poles that are vulnerable? This question you, is from Becky. Becky, good question. And if you go to everettpost.com, uh, I think I did a story on exactly that topic uh, probably in the month of October. Um, so if you go back, you'll see that. But in short, um, it is about 10 percent, uh, excuse me, 10 times as expensive to put underground wiring in than it is for the overhead. In addition, uh, with regards to restoring power, it takes a much longer time period to diagnose where the problem is when it's underground versus where we can see it above. Um, so, but that news story really goes into the details. I interviewed somebody at Snohomish County PUD on that topic, and you'll find all the details in that story. Rob, do you think you can find that story and, and uh, paste it in the chat? Ooh, good Rob's, idea. Rob's our yeah. research guy. He's going to yep. look Good that. idea. I am, I'm working on it. <laughs> it's either it's probably going to be under the things to know uh, segment as opposed to the North Sound stories. That's my educated guess off the top of my head. OK, we're going to look for that. Um, several people, including Jim, have asked about the effect of global climate change on these kinds of storm systems. Good question. Um, I. I do a course with the National Disaster Preparedness Training Center that focuses on climate change adaptation for emergency managers. It's been a very popular course uh, here the last few years. So here's some, some key facts out of all this. Number one, I think it's um, well demonstrated that our planet is warming, both in the atmosphere and in the ocean. I just mentioned all those hurricanes in the uh, Atlantic Basin in the last couple of years as a one really good example of that. So because of a warmer atmosphere, uh, looking at the physics behind it, your air can hold more water because it's warmer. And so the old phrase, what goes up must come back down, and it helps to translate to all of the significant heavy rain and flooding events we've seen around the globe just in the past year is one example the floods in Europe or in Middle Tennessee or in New York and New Jersey in the wake of Ida, um, even Hurricane Ida when it made landfall in Louisiana is another example of that. So with regards to strong, intense uh, windstorms, um, these things are driven by strong contrasts in temperature from the polar region to the tropical region. And if we're warming up particularly the tropical region. I know it's getting warmer in the polar region, but that contrast is not quite as strong. Then we have can have the tendency to have even stronger, deeper uh, uh, low pressure systems, such as the uh, bomb cyclones we saw off our coast back in October. I hope that answers your question. I think it does. It's an awfully big topic. <laughs> well, we, we, could, we could spend a night on that. Um, this is a great question. This Amy mentioned this and then another person added on to it. So um, what has been done to improve prediction and warning systems? And another person called out the fact that um, warning systems maybe should be in other languages. That could be a systemic change that would make them more inclusive. Um, can you tell us about that kind of planning? You're talking to the chair of the Washington State Emergency Communications Committee. So if anybody can answer this, I sure hope I can. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, with regards to uh, like weather computer modeling and those kinds of things, 
because of all the enhancements and computer power going even back into the 1960s. Um, it's just gone phenomenally uh, with regards to technology in that regard. Imagine the smartphone that you hold in your hand, it has more computer power than it does for that IBM 8088 that you had back in the late 1980s or early 1990s. Um, the speed, the uh, power, the what it can do, what that technology can do. So with regards to computer modeling for weather forecasting, um, they, they look at things on a global scale. You can also bring it into a regional scale, but you can really enhance the resolution. By that, I'm talking about little pixels. I can remember one model had a 40 nautical mile by 40 nautical mile pixel. I mean, that's huge. Today, you can get those pixels down close to one nautical mile by one nautical mile. So that's how much the computer power has done that uh, with regards to being able to run these of physics, the mathematical equations behind how the weather is driven from the surface all the way up past where the jets fly for every spot on the globe, uh, you're able to get finer and finer resolution and get greater and greater detail on how these storms are going to behave. Now, they're still not perfect. Um, and our region around here, our weather is terrain driven. That's why you go from one place to another to another, it can be dramatically different. Um, I think I was noting it yesterday afternoon that right in the Everett area, maybe up towards uh, Oak Harbor, we were in what I call the donut hole. It's raining like gangbusters everywhere else, but we're on the lee side of the Olympics getting a rain shadow effect. That's why much of Snohomish County, at least the western part and on into Island County, didn't get too much rain compared to all the places to the north and up in the Cascades, the Olympics and further south towards Seattle, etc. Um, they had a lot more rain because they were not in the uh, rain shadow. So again, there's that resolution in the computer models and have really enhanced the accuracy of those kinds of things. Now, with regards to communications of this, a lot of enhancements, even going back into the 1990s, I mentioned the inauguration day windstorm and how things didn't work too well. Two years later, actually a little less than two years later, had another windstorm, a lot better in that regard. Um, all the partners in media, you know, so your TV weather anchors, radio stations, etc. I mentioned our NOAA weather radio is another uh, tool in the toolbox for you. Um, I will say your smartphone is good. However, I challenge you to talk to other people. Oh, I've got Verizon. I've got an iPhone. I've got AT&T. Ask them for the forecast for their location for, say, tomorrow and compare and see the differences. Because hmm. many of the smartphone apps will use just pure computer output from one model or another. Keep in mind, they're not perfect and they do differ from time to time, uh, from one model to the next and from day to day uh, as well. And you will probably get a different forecast from one smartphone to another or another weather weather app or another weather app, uh, those kinds of things. So there's still some challenges in that regard. But when it comes to dangerous, high impact, significant, life threatening type events, that's where the emergency alert system or for your smartphone, what's called wireless emergency alerts comes into play. Your weather radio is going to give you the full meal deal. Your smartphone only has a small suite of that. Let me give you an example of it. And I think we witnessed it just a few years ago. There was a big earthquake in January of 2020, if my memory serves me right, uh, near Kodiak Island. And they put out a tsunami watch for the Washington coast. Now that activates the emergency alert system, but it does not activate your, your wireless emergency alerts, that smartphone in your hand. And um, so some people on the Washington coast, 40% of the people in Grace Harbor County have a weather radio because they're worried about the tsunami issue and rightly so. Um, they got it at 2.30 in the morning, whereas others did not. So there was confusion. Well, how come you got the tsunami watch and I didn't? Well, there's the reason why uh, between your weather radio versus your smartphone. So still a lot of education and work to do with the general public as a whole, but hopefully you've learned a lesson here tonight you might want to consider that getting that no other radio for your home, your business, your car, uh, your school, your healthcare facility, your place of worship, et cetera. It can save lives. I hope that answered your question. 
Okay. Questions are continuing to roll in as you speak. Um, uh, from Judy, was there air traffic en route during the Columbus Day storm? And what was the result? What happened Ooh, to that? Um, I do not know the specific answer for that. Uh, educated guess is they would shut down all the airports uh, because they want to get tie down the aircraft so they don't flip over and have significant damage. You saw what happened with some of the light aircraft there that even though they put it into the hangars, well, when the hangars lose <laughs> their structure, their roof and their walls, well, it leaves the planes kind of vulnerable too. Uh, but when it comes to commercial aircraft, uh, they pretty much shut everything down uh, along the West Coast that was impacted. Okay. And then similarly from Jamie and Brian, do you have information about at sea deaths during that 1962 storm? What was that term again? Uh, deaths at sea. Oh, deaths at sea. I don't have any specifics on that. I just know that there were 46 fatalities involved with the storm as a whole. Okay. Um, that that's that's all I can tell you. Odds are probably a few, but most people got, pardon the pun, wind of the storm and set into harbor, into port, and tied up the boat and got the heck out of the way. Yeah. Um, Charmin asks, are the magnetic poles moving? And if so, does that impact the weather here in Washington? The short answer on that latter part is no. Uh, the short answer on their moving, uh, they're constantly moving. There is a, it, but it's very subtle. Uh, that's just the nature of our planet. And that's the nature of our planet within the solar system. I hope that addresses your question. Um, from Alan, what's the difference between U.S. and European weather forecasting models? <laughs> uh, the old competition. And we could talk <laughs> about the U.K. We could talk about the Australian. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with good competition. Um, so the folks in the that run the Euro, uh, the U.S. has invested quite a bit of money to enhance the computer modeling and computer power again. Uh, but it's a constant battle across the, the ocean, uh, across the pond, I guess I should say. And uh, it's good competition um, with regards to U.S. forecasters using the European and, uh, you know, British and European forecasters using U.S. models like the global forecast system, the GFS. Um, they all look at them and the Canadian and others. Uh, again, you're looking at solutions that will hopefully result in a good sound consensus forecast. Uh, it's kind of something called ensemble forecasting, where you take different runs and put them all together for the same time period, etc. And generally speaking, if you ask 10 forecasters for their forecast, you put them all together, you're probably going to be doing pretty well, as opposed to just going with one forecast. Okay. Let's see. Uh, doo, 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 doo. Got quite a grocery list there, huh? Uh, yeah, uh, and, well, and some of them are repeating, so I, that's why I'm combing through them a little bit here. Um, right. You mentioned buoys out in the ocean. Are those still providing weather information, and are there buoys in Puget Sound as well? Uh, the short answer is yes. If you go to the National Data Buoy Center, Rob, you want to look that up? NDBTC, let's go try it again. National Data Buoy Center. Um, and uh, you'll find a link there. You can pull that up, put it in the chat box for folks. Uh, and you'll, you can zoom in on certain geographic areas. You will find some in the Puget Sound area. Most of them are what are called Coastal Marine Automated Networks or CMANs. Uh, West Point, for instance, is one of those. If you ever go out to the lighthouse, you will see a weather instrumentation tower out there just before you get to the lighthouse there at West Point. That's one of them. Uh, another one is up on Smith Island, uh, just west of uh, Whidbey Island. It's right on the east entrance to the Strait of Juan de Fuca. Very windy place. I can remember probably, oh, it must have been eight years ago, maybe even 10 um, during a nice summer some eagles decided that this was a good place to make a home. They built a nest and everything, and then the wind instrumentation wasn't working real well, and the crews went out to find out why and went, 
Oh, hi, Eagles. Why did you make your home here? This is not good. Uh, we had to negotiate with Fish and Wildlife on how to eradicate that situation. Anyway, the short answer is, yeah, there's the buoys are out in the ocean, and along with tsunami detection buoys, as well as in the Strait of Juan de Fuca and in Puget Sound. Canada has them as well. Okay. Uh, I used to live in Newport, Oregon, and we could hear the, the weather buoys, and they, they would uh, there was a bell or something on one of them that we could hear it. It was very nice. Um, <laughs> I believe, unless more of them come in, this is our final question. So you had a map earlier um, with the tracks of several different storms going across it, um, and most of them turned north. Can you describe that phenomenon? Like right before they hit land, they turn north instead of going straight into land. Well, there are a lot of them that will continue straight inland, okay. but they don't intensify. So they're not very significant in comparison to the ones that turn sharply to the left, like NASCAR turning left. And as a result, they will dramatically intensify and deepen um, and before they track up along the coast. So that's why you see that pattern of you know, making that 90 degree left turn uh, approaching the coastline. A lot of other systems uh, you will go into California, et cetera, but not be anywhere near uh, you know, wind producing, you know, strong damaging winds like that at all. And that's the primary reason for that. I see, okay. Okay, I believe that is the end of our questions. Um, thank you so much to everyone who has been here. Uh, this is your your comments and your questions are excellent and really enhanced this program. Um, Ted, do you have any final comments before we close? Well, I just hope that you've learned something from this historic windstorm. It sounds like many of you, or at least some of you, uh, were around for that storm and have your own memories uh, of which you have shared. And I guess I will see here pretty soon, which is great because that's how we share stories uh, down the road to the next generation and the generation after that. It's things like this that help us consider what has happened in the past uh, and could it happen uh, in the future and why we should prepare for it. So again, thank you very much for your time tonight. I hope you've enjoyed this program and I look forward to seeing you sometime down the road with another weather program. Thank you, Ted, and good night, everybody.